in studying out God's will, my wife, my wife told me right, to, there's a, there's a point to all this, right? It's not just some random pickings of scripture. Uh, so starting out the will of God, there are three different aspects, and you guys are going to know these really well because we're going to go over them each time. Three different aspects of, of the will of God. Number one is his sovereign will, and we have his moral will, and we have his individual will. Right? And we are going to get to the individual will, but there's a reason we're going in this order. All right? So like, I want to know about this and that, and we're, we are going to get there. There is a point to this, but in studying out God's moral will, um, we've talked about, what was the first, first aspect we talked about in God's moral will? All men be saved. All right, there's so salvation, and then we, what we talked about last week, sanctification, right? Saved, sanctified. All right, good. I'm glad some people answered that because they're like, man, if I, if, uh, if ever, it's always a dangerous thing for teachers to do, ask those questions. What did we talk about last time? I don't know. God, the Bible, sin, what about it? It's bad. All right, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we're getting past that. You're getting a little bit, a little bit more out of it. Hopefully, I'm keeping you all awake. I, you know, and that's another prayer for me too. Like, I'm not as animated as Pastor, so, and I'm working on my vocal variety, the tone, and all that. You know, he's, he's, he's got lots of energy. So, um, so uh, that's that's my prayer that, that I, I keep you guys engaged, and I'll I'll try to do it to the best of my ability. All right. So, tonight we talked we talked about saved, sanctified, and here's here's a passage of scripture and see if you can figure out the third point, keeping it alliterated. All right. Next passage of scripture here is Ephesians. This is going to be the main text. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter five verses 17 through 20, but here verses 17 and 18. What do you think, keeping alliterated, would be the third point of the moral will of God? Spirit-filled. Correct, sir. You are correct. You win the prize. All right, so that is, that is next. So, saved, sanctified, spirit-filled. It's, it's very clear. I, I guess I should have read that out loud there. Okay. So, yeah, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. Uh, no, I just got ahead of myself. 17. Therefore, be not unwise. Don't be stupid. All right? That's, that's the ESV, the Eggerdahl Standard Version, right? Don't be stupid, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Like, get this, guys. This is what God's will is for your life. And, you know, and, and this is a lot of focus. Every pastor loves this verse, right? And be not drunk with wine. That's not the focus. It doesn't, that, it doesn't end there. Wherein is excess? But rather be filled with the Spirit. So why is that important? We're, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into studying this out. So um, we need to be Spirit-filled believers. Who is the Holy Spirit? Third person of the Trinity, God. Yes, yes. All right, which person of the Trinity of the Godhead is most important? That's a, that's a bad question, right? <laughs> See, you can ask questions that is not a, not a good question to ask. It's not a logical question to ask. They're all equally God, right? They're all equally God. However, they do, have, they do show different authority. The Son submits to the Father, willingly submits to the Father. The Holy Spirit does the will of the Son. And, and you see that as in, in that proper place and order and its structure you see from the very beginning that God created, God wanted the man to be the head of the household so that's another, another uh, wrong question to ask, who's more important, the man or the woman alright, get yourself in trouble there alright, well the man is to be in charge, so he must be more important, no it's just God chose, chose the man there has to be order uh, anything with two heads is a monster Anything with no head is dead, right? Took that from Adrian Rogers. But like, man, that just makes sense. So God chose man to be the head of the household, the protector. Uh, in that sense, and we see that order in Scripture. So the Holy Spirit, I, I mean, 
this is this one. I mean, this was a two-part message, and I try, I wanted to condense it to one because I don't want to stretch this out. But studying out pneumatology, or the study of the Holy Spirit, is a great topic to study out. There's so much, obviously, uh, in seeing who He is. And one of the classes I taught went through that. The, went through the Trinity and each of the persons of the Trinity we discussed. And it's interesting. In my other class, I was teaching through the Book of Acts, and you see how the Spirit comes on scene there first off when, when Christ leaves. So that's a little bit about who the Spirit is. So what is what is his role? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? He has a lot of roles, I'll put it that way, but um, and we can't you know there's some aspects that we do see, all right? And like I said, that's a whole nother study, whole nother message. Um, but how he works. How do we see him work in Scripture? Well, what, are, what are some of the things that you see? And I've got to stop answering my own questions. Um, what, what do you see the Holy Spirit doing? Let's start in the Old Testament. What, do you, what does he do? What are ways that he is evidenced? Now, he, he empowers. Like, who, what are some examples of some people he empowers? Samson. First on my list, too. When you think of someone who's empow- empowered or has powers, I, 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 love, I love the character of Samson in the sense of he's like a superhero, kind of, except for he's a very flawed superhero, a very, very flawed superhero. Um, and the things that he did were absolutely supernatural, not natural. And because to take on hundreds and thousands by a single man doing that. Like, it's, it's more that you think, yeah, he was the strongest man to ever live, but it's more than that. Either he had, like, he had, like, impenetrable skin, like, bulletproof skin where swords and, and spears or nothing could, you know, they're bouncing off him, and the arrows are being shot at him, and you think, if, if even this, like, this guy is super strong, somebody would take him down. But either that or he's just super fast. He's, like, the Flash and super strong, whatever else. But anyways, you see the Holy Spirit come on this guy, and, and he was a Nazarite and all these other things, but yet when it came down to decisions, he always made the wrong decision. Um, and although he was, once again, he was, he was not stupid either. Uh, he, he, had, he had these riddles um, that for whatever reason even rhymed in, in, in the English language. But uh, yeah, I, I find it interesting, those different things. But you, you see how the Holy Spirit works and empowers him in, in these different ways. And that's a whole, whole other, like I said, a whole other study. Then, then you look at the life of David, and, and so you see him in the, in, in the judges. You can go through, we can go throughout the line of the judges. We can go through the, look, and look at the kings. You can look at the prophets. And then I was talking to Brother Stan, even some obscure characters who are like, why are they even in the Bible? Like this story of Ruth initially. Initially, it's like, she's like this no-name character. She's a Moabite. And how does she fit into this structure of Scripture? Well, we find out later in the genealogies that she's in the, in the very line of Christ and other things. But, and even though like, you don't see God mentioned directly in the book of Ruth, you see his workings all throughout it. Uh, so it's interesting. You see often, and once again, obviously the prophets, even King Saul prophesied. And others. So the Holy Spirit works there in, in those ways where he comes for a time on different individuals and speaks to them and empowers them to do different things. How about the New Testament? What, he, t- he takes on, it's the same person, but he takes on a little different role. Where do we see the Holy Spirit come on scene in the New Testament? At Pentecost, yeah. And, but that's, that's where he, he really he comes, but... What has to happen before the Holy Spirit can come? It was prayer. Prayer. What else? What else was, it, was important? So, um, give me this. I, I don't think I didn't think I didn't put the verse up there. Maybe I did. I put John sixteen seven on there. Yeah, I did. Okay, there. Uh, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient that I go away. This is Christ talking. For if I go not away, the Comforter that is the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him 
that should be capitalized there. But yeah, unto you. So Christ told them of the promise of this comforter, the, the Holy Spirit would come on them, but he couldn't until Christ left. He established that the church age and everything happened when the Holy Spirit empowered men to do these different things. So that's just a little bit about how those, those workings out. And of course, you see the book of Acts, and we're going to get to talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, what is the difference between the filling of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit? Which sometimes you hear those, those kind of terms being thrown around. Um, and then, for that matter, is it is it uh, is being indwelled by the Spirit the same thing? So to talk about that there. So Scripture, uh, you see these different terms used in Scripture and different different ideas of, of what this looks like. So number one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm not going to ask for raising hands. How many have been baptized by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> okay. Um, if you are saved, if you're believing, if you're trusted in Christ then yes, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. All right, because that's what happens at salvation. We are all baptized by the Holy Spirit. Um, and this only occurs once in the life of a believer. The baptism shouldn't be pursued as though it's some special gift reserved for, uh, for spiritual Christians. But now you can be baptized by the Holy Spirit years after salvation. Um, or there was a graduation of my wife was at, and one of the speakers said that this guy going throughout his life, I think it was, was it Isaac Watts, or was it Isaac, uh, who's the, no, 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 it was um, William Wilberforce. Yeah, he said he realized he's a Christian later in life. Like, no, I don't think so, that didn't quite work that way. Like, oh, I'm a Christian, just found out. I'm, I'm a believer. Um, but anyways, it, it is, it's, it's a moment where this, this does occur, where the Holy Spirit in the wells you, uh, or as, as you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, he comes into your life at the moment of salvation. So 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. We are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and all, and have been made, all been made to drink into one Spirit. So all believers, all those who trust in Christ, are baptized in one body. In Christ. Uh, Titus 3 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit refers to the Spirit continuously dwelling in every believer after the initial <clears throat> baptism that we talked about as every believer receives at salvation. Um, you see, 1 Corinthians 3 16 says, no, you're not that you're a temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Uh, he takes up residence in us. Um, without the Spirit's presence, no person can be a Christian. Uh, Romans 8, 9 says, uh, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, and the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell you, you are not a believer. You are not, you have not put your faith and trust in Christ. You are not a Christian for that matter. Alright? So the talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the filling of the Holy Spirit uh, occurs when the believer opens his life completely to the Holy Spirit's control. And that's what we're going to focus on this evening. Ephesians 5:18. The baptism, the indwelling, and the filling of the Spirit all happened at the same time. All right, so what does it mean to be <coughs> spirit-filled? I'm not, I'm not gonna, not gonna ask for a raise of hands, but I want you to think about this. <laughs> he's raising his hand right now. <laughs> How many of you are spirit-filled? Um, like, well, I have the spirit in me. Okay, well, let's talk a little more. Be spirit-filled, being spirit control. Alright? Uh, first off, I do want to mention again, he, he, and I always want to emphasize, it's, it's, I don't see it. The term we use is he. It's not it. He is a person. The part, part of the Trinity. 
He is not merely a resource to be used or depleted, right? So how's your tank? How much Holy Spirit do you have today? I'm running a little bit low. God, give me some more spirit. Give me some more. Oh, we're filling up. And you know, it's it's you know, that's something that's something that's just getting more and more scary today, right? You know, they're looking at looking at your uh, your tank, your gas tank. Oh, I think I can make it a little bit longer. Maybe the prices will come down. Um, but yeah, we don't have a, a Holy Spirit gauge per se in our life. Either you're being filled, controlled by the Spirit, or you are you quenching the Spirit. You're allowing yourself to be controlled by the flesh. You're following the direction of this world. So there are many people confused about um, as to why God does not reveal His will, who they should marry, what job they should take, and and all these other questions that they might have when they're not following the will of God and yielding control of their lives to the Holy Spirit. Why should God show us his individual will if we are not even fulfilling what God has already clearly stated in his moral will? Let's see that we fulfill the Spirit. So not only, he is not merely a resource to be used or depleted, he does not come in different portions or doses. Nothing about the Holy Spirit. Once again, um, yeah, different. So you can say different fillings of the Holy Spirit. Which cup is really filled? You know, which is is that is that as one the second one over is it halfway or you know halfway full or halfway empty? You know, that 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 whole idea. Where, where where is it at? It's just being filled. That one looks like it's full to the brim. And so we can see these are different qualities of believers. This person is that person is forty five percent. Filled with the Holy Spirit, and it, it seems like it's it's we have this idea that He comes in qualities. God, send your spirit. You, you might hear prayers like that. God, send your spirit. Well, He's already here. He's already here. And if you're a believer, He's already in you. Or you might hear another prayer like, God, give me more of your spirit. And that's once again the idea that He comes in doses, right? You know, so like you need to get your Holy Spirit shot, your Holy Spirit vaccine, and you get your booster, Holy Spirit booster, and whatever else. All right, that's a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. It's He is not an it. He's a person, and um, that that's that's something we understand. So that you don't get your Holy Spirit juice or whatever else. I just want to be very clear on that. But sometimes we fall into that kind of understanding and, and misunderstand who. Who he is, and we, and I think that that's a lot of times in our good intentions, we want to be careful not to be slipped into the Pentecostal realm, where I think we have a different understanding of the Holy Spirit, and where where people are doing some unorthodox things, uh, you know, foaming in the mouth and 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 having convulsions in the aisle, um, which is a you know. Not the understanding that we have here. I haven't seen that happen since I've been here, but but that does happen at churches where there's things that are just like, what is going on? Some part like a dog or whatever else. Uh, this is where so we want to stay so far away from that, so then we minimize the role of the Holy Spirit and say, well, his his, his role is not important. Well, that's not what we see in Scripture. His role is absolutely important, and we need we must be spirit filled if we're going to be in the will of God. So he's not a commodity, he's a person as well as all believers. He can be grieved, as we see in Scripture. He can be quenched. If we're truly looking to do God's will, then we will be controlled by the Spirit. Now, the Apostle Peter illustrates this. Uh, we see uh, the things that he does, once again, empowered by the Spirit. He walked, uh, uh, he walked on water. He walked on water. So, I, I love this. When you think of Peter, uh, how this is illustrated. Jesus is over there. I'm here. That's not good. I want to be where Jesus is at. And I'm not patient. He was not a patient man. He was not patient enough to wait until Christ got there to the boat, right? He saw Christ walking on water. So I want to be out there where he is. So he asked to step out. You know, a lot of people like to be critical of Peter. Like, oh, he, he looked away. He saw the storm. He sank. And how many of you were still on the boat, right? <laughs> He at least had the, the, the courage to step out and trust, trust in the Lord. And then he took his eyes off Christ and he fell. 
We see also that he prophesied. In Mark 6, uh, 16, verses 15 through 17, he saith unto him, but who, Christ says this, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's pretty profound. The, the, and then, I love Christ's response to this, and Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven revealed that to him through the Holy Spirit. We see the, the supernatural and how he displayed uncommon courage with that one sword, and he went in, and I don't know what he was attempting to do. I don't think he was trying to show his skill with the sword and taking off the ear. But I, this, this is how good I am. Uh, he was ready to fight and die. He was outnumbered, outarmed, outmanned, outtrained, and he was ready to fight to the death for Christ. That wasn't God's plan, but we see these different things. Yet, later, Peter blows it three times, denying Christ just a short while later. Think about it. He was only able to do these things, walking in water, the prophesying, the uncommon courage. He's only able to do these things in the presence of Christ. Yes, the scripture seems to picture it this way, that Peter followed so closely that when Christ stopped, he bumped into him. Like they, that, that picture, but man, that's that's how we should do it. Uh, Brother Stan mentioned that too in the Everest Communication Fellowship. Abraham, a friend of God. How many of you would like to be called a friend of God? Peter was that to Christ. He was part of their circle. I don't think because Christ specifically just said, I want you to be my main guy, Peter. And it happened later, but because Peter chose to want to walk so closely with Christ. So Christ had that intimate relationship with him. Uh, many people say you're as close to Christ as you want to be. So anyways, when, it came, when the day came when Jesus ascended into heaven, you might think that Peter is through, because no longer is he able to do those things, because Christ is no longer there. However, soon after Christ's ascension, we see in Acts 2, 14, Peter boldly expounds the scriptures. Right? And um, they, he saw all the things, all that happened to Christ. And you know, you think he backed down before. Like, man, the crucifixion, the scourging, and all that Christ went through that. You think, I don't want any part of that. That's that's too much. But he, he uh that's a whole other thing I wanted to, I could get into, but in this in the study of the book of Acts. But it's it's really neat how he quotes these prophets, Isaiah, and he quotes Joel and David and others as he goes through there and he boldly expounds these truths. There in verse 14 it says, Peter standing uh, with the eleven, lift up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. And he lays out how these people are the very people that took the life of Christ. And they didn't like what he was saying. They, they called, he called them what they were, murderers. And he pointed it out. And, we, and you see that through that, thousands of people in the preaching of these, these messages that we see here in the book of Acts were saved, came to knowledge of Christ. How was he able to do that from this no name Fisher, not no longer being of Christ? How was he able to do those things, to have that boldness to, to do that? <laughs> By the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit couldn't come until Christ left. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is powerful. He works in the life of the Apostle Peter. And guess what? He wants to work through you. He is in you. Like I said, he can be grieved. He can be quenched. We ignore him. We, we push away his leading. And so we understand that this is so vitally important for us. Uh, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit as Peter and the apostles and many uh, be, many after him and during that time were spirit-controlled believers. So how then can we, that's the second point, how can we be filled with the Spirit? Same passage in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and 
Let's look at that. We looked at verses 17 and 18. Look at, look, look at verse 19. All right? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. We can stop there for a minute. Speaking to yourselves, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. The songs that we sing are important. It's, it's a time of reflection. There's the doctrine. There's in many of these songs. This is how the truths were presented to be remembered and to be passed on and to be sung when, we, when you go out of the church. Um, I didn't know anyone else was here. Pastor was usually in his office, and then it's just me here. So I was, I like the acoustics in the hallway and everything. So I was just, you know, singing out in the hallway. And I didn't know Amy was here cleaning one of those times, but she's like, hey, when's the concert? Uh, but, but that's, we should be, we should, that, that should happen. Hey, when you're in the car alone, singing out these songs of praise that, that, are, that are bringing praise, praise in your heart. You don't have to just do that at church. But wherever you're at, and meditatively thinking about the words, have our praise and attention and focus on Him. So songs, hymns, spiritual songs, this, this making melody. So David, David was a very gifted warrior, but he also had some other talents. What else was David good at? Music. Music. So David, um, he played for Saul when he was plagued by evil spirit. First Samuel 16, 23, and it came to pass that when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand, and so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit parted from him. So music can have an effect on your demeanor in your life. And, and listen, um, yeah, this, I'm not going to just preach a message on music here, all right? You probably heard, heard a lot of that. And, you know, for those of you who listen to country, I grew up in West Virginia, so I heard plenty of it, right? But, um, yeah, you know, you know what happens when you play country music backwards, right? <laughs> Jason knows. I see him laughing back there. No, you don't know? You don't know? See what you said. <laughs> like the, you get your dog back, your house back, your wife back, everything. So, anyways. So, uh, so that's, I know, sorry. Dead joke. But, uh, yes. Uh, if you listen to music that's going to be uplifting, and I, I mentioned that before in my testimony, that like there's so often that we listen to music by the world, that secular is like, well, it doesn't talk about immorality, it doesn't have bad language in it. Yeah, it's good. It's just, it's, it's an oldie. An oldie, so it's a goodie, you know? So oldies are goodies. And now, now 80s and 90s music is oldies. That's crazy. But again, that, that's, it's that whole idea. But our hearts are so prone to wander. We need to listen to music that's going to be Christ. That's going to draw our focus and attention back to Him. And I think that I mentioned that before. Um, yeah. I had that CD in our car. How my dad addressed that later on as an adult. I was like, oh man, I forgot that it was in there. And he's going to take it for a test drive. And I was like, oh man, this, i got to, I got to shut that off somehow. But he explained that to me that, hey, as when he was getting right with God, he realized that he needed to listen to more music um, that would be draw our attention to him. And music does have a huge effect on our life and demeanor and our walk with the Lord. So that's why it's important. That's why it's mentioned here within the will of God. And you know, you've mentioned that other people talk, talk about this, this devil's music and you want to be first thing most people do is write on oh, the devil's music it has this beat or whatever it's not on the platonic scale and like, I mean you're talking over my head but <laughs> however they could be partially right if you think about it but, but what is what was Satan's main ministry well he was Lucifer while he was there in heaven he was, he was over the music he was over those things so of course he could use that and twist that to be something that would take your attention your focus your eyes off God so we need to be careful what we're playing in our car, what we're allowing in our home. And that, that we, we need to consider those things. Is this drawing me closer to God? Or if it's not, it's going to have the opposite effect. So consider that when you consider what, what is the majority of what you're listening to and how is your relationship with Christ? Music is going to have an effect on that. So, um, hopefully we're listening to things that are spiritually uplifting and exalting. 
So singing psalms, that's just the one point. And secondly, satisfaction. I was going through the points with Joanna, and I was going to see if she could, if she could remember some of these. And she's like, satisfaction, that's a point, right? Like, well, it's a sub-point in there, in the will of God. And I, it could be a whole point. You're right. We could spend a whole other week on that. To be honest, it wouldn't be too difficult uh, to look into that. Scripture has a lot to say about that. But there in verse 20, it says, giving thanks sometimes for some things. Boy, that's not what it says there. I think a lot of us would like it better if it said that. Because, like, man, you can't, you can't really mean all times. And certainly not for all things. Because there's bad things that happen in life. No, but it says, giving thanks always for all things. Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the, through the troubles and tribulations of life, how can we do that? By the grace of God. If we're allowing the Spirit to control us, having the right attitude, the right demeanor, the right spirit. I've mentioned this before, but sometimes the, pe the most joyous, happy people to be around have gone through the greatest trials that you can imagine. You just wouldn't know it. And some people have it relatively not too bad. But they're just always, they're always negative. You know, it's like, oh, like, oh, um, yeah, yeah, Facebook, whatever else for the for you, for the, for us older people, because I, I guess I'm in that category now, the young, younger generation don't does not use that, but um, it's not a place I would go if I just wanted to be edified and built up. And there's some great posts, and there's some good things, but sometimes it's it's, uh, it's a place where people feel like we can vent about the troubles of their life and, and mentioning different difficulties without mentioning people specifically, but making sure that you leave people the person that you know to talk about, whatever. So anyways, um, but being joyful, being thankful for all things, truly, having a right, that right attitude, that would go, go a long way. Um, so, I want to take you to another passage that is very similar to this one, and same author. Paul, author of Ephesians, he also authored Colossians. So, Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 17. Colossians 3, 17, it says, and Whatsoever you do, in all, uh, do in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So that has the idea, once again, of giving thanks. But also, I want to see how this ties in, this understanding of giving thanks. Go back to verse 16. Actually, you can go back to verse 15. <clears throat> verse 15 says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. So it's like, if you don't get that there, then we'll just, we'll just go back to it. Verse 17, it's important to be thankful individuals. To tell our, try to encourage our children to be thankful. So if something's done for you, to, to give thanks. And... That's, that's something I think that's uh, you can't do too much of, honestly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and and letting letting people know that you are appreciative for, for what they've done for you. Be thankful for what God has given us. All right, now verse sixteen. This is going to sound very familiar to the passage we just read through Ephesians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms. And hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. Very familiar to the Ephesians passage. He's obviously speaking to the church of Ephesus and the church of Colossae there. <clears throat> but getting this, this message across and having that, that same theme, that same idea. The difference being that one says here, being filled with the Spirit, there in Ephesians 5. Uh, 18, and then Colossians 3, 16 says that the word of Christ will be richly. That would be the, really the, the one main difference. But then I also see the similarity there. So 
If we are to be filled with the Spirit, we need to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly with all wisdom, right? So that is it. That's important to that understanding. If we really want the Spirit to dwell in us, well, how can we do that? We've got to be in the Word of God. We've got to be studying it out. We've got to be making that a part of our lives. So, singing songs in satisfaction. Satisfaction, giving thanks. And if, it wasn't, if that wasn't clear enough, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, what's God's will for my life? I love it when passages just laid out that clearly. This is the will of God. For this is the will of God. Well, this must be the will of God in my life. Right? This is clear, clearly laid out here in Scripture. So, um, looking at the, these lists, looking at the similarities there, we need to dwell, let, to let it dwell in us richly, we need to saturate ourselves with the Word of God. Saturate ourselves with the Word of God. Living every moment as if you're standing in the presence of Christ. You know, as, as Peter was able to do those supernatural things, because once again, he's close to Christ, but now we have the Spirit with us as believers always. We need to trust in Him. We need to, draw, to allow Him to work through our lives. We need to, to be listening to Him through, through the Word, letting Him work through the Word in our lives. And the only way to be saturated with Christ is to read, study the book that discloses all that He is. This book from cover to cover is the biography of our God and the message of the Messiah. It speaks to us. God speaks to us through it. So, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According to His divine power, which is infinite, which is absolutely awesome, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, do you believe that? That this book has all the answers? It does. All the answers to all the problems in all the world, God's Word has the answers. Sometimes we might have to dig a little deeper. But I'm so thankful for that. He's given us in this book all that we need. So the more you study God's Word, the more you saturate your mind, your life with it. If you give yourself to the study of Scripture, you'll have no problem thinking about Christ. In fact, you won't be able to stop thinking about Him. That's what it is to be Spirit-filled, to live a Christ-conscious life. And there's no shortcut. Focus your attention on the glory of God. I forgot to put the author down for this, but the, or the, uh, the quote, you can Google it, all right? Um, you become what you behold. You become what you behold. So what are you beholding? Reviewing. So like now, you know, I don't know how many of you actually get to get up an old newspaper, you know, still get that, still get that thrown at your doorstep. Or how many of you are watching Newsmax on your phone or um, Fox News or whatever else? And there are other news networks, I guess, too. Yeah. Uh, whatever you're getting your information from, you know, are you spending time dwelling on those things? Are you spending time checking Facebook or checking uh, TikTok or, or what's that? Instagram. Yeah, I, I have an Instagram account I set up back in, I don't know, like eight years ago. I don't think I've used since then. But yeah, um, I thought it'd be a good way of communicating. I was like, just send up pictures on there. I, don't, I, I never really got the point of it. So um, I guess I've been just too old for that. But, but uh, yeah, whatever you're doing, are you just, are you spending more time doing that than you're spending time in this book? Uh, I like one of those one of the wild videos we had. Uh, I love how they usually bring bring like the best clips of the message, and and Tom Farrell standing there. He's like, "How much time are you spending on Facebook as opposed to this book?" Something like that. It's incredible like that. But 
really, if we're gonna write, if we're gonna, if we're gonna put down that time, if we're gonna budget out your time, how much time do you really spend in God's word as opposed to all of these other things that can have your attention? You become, once again, what you behold. Now last week we talked about being sanctified, set apart, holy. And so many believers are, I've heard this so often that, you know, I can allow this and that because I'm a mature believer. But it is true, you become what you behold. Well, I would never do that. I understand that believers shouldn't do that, but it's okay for me to, to view it. You become what you behold. We need to be very careful what we're viewing and the time that we spend doing it. It could be good things. I mean, I, I tell my wife, it's good to listen to the news and find out what's going on. She's like, oh, please, please, let's, let's, not, let's not listen to that. Or, it's depressing. I just kind of want to know what's going on in the country um, every now and again. Um, and pastor, of course, encourages you not to turn your radio on your car. So, um, but uh, to meditate. And that's good, to be meditated. Maybe shut it off and sing songs of family. Memorize scripture. There's a lot of other better uses of your time. Play an audio Bible in your car, right? Uh, but how much time are you invested in that as opposed to other things? Your screen time. And this is this is such a blessing, isn't it? Being able to have instant access to the to the world wide web and um, all the things that it can do. And you can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, and there's no end to it. All right? I have one, so I'm not preaching against it. But at the same time, you know, whenever there's a spare moment, is that what we go to? Now, hey, great, you've got the Bible app on here, and you're just reading, and that's, that's wonderful. But it's, sometimes it can be distracting. Yeah, you know, it's like, and I know that that's, that's changing today, like, like, not as many people have the hard copies, but I, I used to, like, as a youth pastor, I'd snatch up the phone and they're like, I think Pastor Matt just pulled the Bible. I'm like, no, you're looking at Facebook. No, but, uh, I, I'm so hated. But, uh, it was, it's, like, it's too easy to, to scroll over. And, and, uh, I've had, I've had, I've had it mentioned, I think, at every, every church, though, like, you'd be kind of surprised to go around if we could. If we could, um, we're not going to do this, and we don't even know how we could do this. Um, but pull up, pop on screens up here what people are viewing in church on their cell phones. <laughs> See, everyone's like putting their cell phone away right now. Pull on their Facebook, or they I just catch up. I got like 5,000 emails. I, gotta, I don't have any other time to check them. I'm going to check them in church. Uh, might be something important I just got today. Yeah. Oh, I got a I got a notation from Amazon that we got our uh, yeah. That's cool. All right. So whatever else we can we can like I said it can be very convenient to know all these things. But you become what you behold. What what is taking your time? What are you watching? I encourage you um, to, that our we want our minds to be renewed. We knew we need to stop watching. We need to stop following the world. Why do we want to be entertained by the unbelieving so much? Once again, this message is me. I, I like to be entertained. I like superhero stuff. I like I like martial arts. I like fighting. I, I like uh, there's a lot of things I like to to watch to see. Uh, how much time are we, are we spending God's words opposed to that? We are so glued to small devices, so hooked on television, movies, internet, social media, that we just don't have time to really spend to invest in God's Word. So we allow the world to tell us, to show us, to feed us, to shape us, to make us. And that's what we're doing. You know, I'm not really affected by what I, what I watch, but once again, we are. you become what you behold. You become what you behold. You behold. So if you were to match those things up right now, if you were to write down your time schedule and do that, how much time would you be spending on your phone or the TV compared to how much time you spend in the Word? Could that be why we live in weakness and failure 
when temptations come in our lives? Is that why we don't have an effect in this world like we'd like to have? Is that why our relationships can't be fixed? Is there some connection that we focus so much on the world? We live in the world, we ooze the world, we watch the world, we read the world. So how many of us read books that have spiritual wisdom? Look at television that has spiritual wisdom. Watch movies that have spiritual wisdom. Read the Bible that has spiritual wisdom. How much time do we devote to biblical principle that is unquestionable? This, this, this principle that you become what you behold. Take a moment to examine yourself. Could it be said of you that you are not only saved and sanctified, but also that you are spirit-filled? Can you say that, that that's true about me? I, I, I may have a long way to go, but at this point in my life, I can say that I am yielding my life completely to the control of the Spirit. If you, if you believe that's true of your life right now at this point, say, Pastor Matt, I believe I, I am yielded to the Spirit. He is in control of my life. That is my testimony. If that's true about you, I ask you to raise your hands this time. Lower your hands. Understandably, not a lot of hands raised. For those of you who couldn't raise your hand, do you want to become holy like Him? Do you want to become new? So you see like Jesus, think like Jesus, feel like Jesus, love like Jesus, care like Jesus, judge like Jesus. If this is your desire, I'd ask you to raise your hand. Lower your hands. That's true about you. You know the answer already. You've got to watch Jesus a lot. You've got to be in His Word. If not, you cannot begin to know what God's will for your life is, and you will not make Christ conscious decisions. So look to Him through the reading of his word, allow it to change you to be more like him.